This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers, on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions of software engineering topics at least once a month. SE Radio is brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine, online at computer.org slash software. This is Robert Blumen for Software Engineering Radio. I have with me today Dr. Anil Madhavapedi. Dr. Madhava Petty earned his doctoral degree at the University of Cambridge Computer Laboratory in the Systems Research Group. He is a senior research fellow at Cambridge, where he was on the team that developed the Zen Hypervisor, leads the OCaml Labs group, and is developing the Mirage Cloud Operating System. He is also the co-author of the recently published book, Real World OCaml, Functional Programming for the Masses. Anil, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Thank you, Robert. Great to be here. Today, we will be talking about the Mirage microkernel. Please tell the listeners anything more about your background you'd like them to know. I think my uh, my discovery of functional programming is, uh, is fairly typical of a lot of people that, uh, that find themselves using uh, these techniques more and more. So I, I started... Uh, working in open source in the late 90s, and uh, a lot of my initial code was actually developing online games, uh, things like MUDs and multi multi-user games that are developed in uh, in C and uh, C++. Uh, and I found myself working a lot in PHP because uh, that was a very convenient way in the late 90s to build websites. Uh, and I worked in open source software like uh, Horde and Imp, which is a very popular webmail system. Uh, and I found myself working on an operating system called OpenBSD, increasingly. And what OpenBSD had was uh, the Unix philosophy, but it had a real emphasis on correctness and stability and simplicity. And uh, I found myself working on uh, little bits of infrastructure like OpenSSH and uh, a lot of the other uh, daemons that form OpenBSD that are used by other operating systems as well, uh, and really enjoying this uh, emphasis on a nice, clean Unix philosophy. When I started my PhD, I, I actually ended up uh, trying to do a lot of work in OpenBSD to make it uh, more secure. So I worked on uh, bounce checkers for the uh, the compiler to check for common errors. And after a while, uh, I just got exhausted because it was so very, very difficult trying to build stable, reliable systems on top of uh, a foundation with an unsafe language like C. And during my PhD, I discovered uh, programming on Camel, which uh, I'll talk about more in this interview. And for the last uh, 12 or 13 years, I've almost exclusively been building systems uh, typically for data centers and uh, other distributed systems uh, using OCaml. And uh, some of the really nice properties that OCaml brings to the table are that it's very much like C. So um, it, you don't have to be a magic uh, mathematician or a highly trained computer scientist to understand it. It's very, very accessible to people who are familiar with working in low-level systems. So I just wanted to emphasize that my background isn't really uh, a very, very deep mathematical training. It's just a normal programmer uh, trying to build systems that work as simply and uh, as efficiently as possible. Your biographical background is giving us some insight into how you evolved from the BSD model to the microkernel model. I'd like to come back to that. But first, can you explain the difference between a microkernel and a monolithic kernel? I certainly can. So whenever you have a general purpose operating system, it it tries to provide you as uh, as convenient an environment as possible for serving up application needs. So if you take a Linux kernel, it not only provides you with the ability to boot on a lot of hardware, it provides you with uh, device drivers to drive the physical hardware using a, a nice, well-defined API. Well, mostly nice, uh, sometimes uh, and sometimes well-defined, like the Sockets API. Uh, but it also provides you, in addition to these device drivers, a lot of other uh, resources. For example, it provides you with a TCP IP stack that can let you do network communication uh, using well-defined protocols. It provides you with a shell interface where you can actually execute scripts and other code. Uh, it provides you with uh, many, many storage protocols and file systems that will that will uh, decide exactly what the layout of your disk looks like. And all of these together form um, a very uh, clustered environment in which you have to obey what the kernel wants you to do in order to uh, make any progress. A microkernel uh, has a slightly different emphasis. A microkernel, there's many, many different services that operate independently um, that minimize the amount of privilege they have. 
uh, and they have to intercommunicate with other components in the system to, f to give you a reliable service. So a microkernel is much more like a distributed system, where uh, if I wanted to have a network stack communicate with my disk, in a microkernel, I would have two separate processes running that would uh, that w I would have to uh, make talk to each other in order to serve up uh, a file from the disk over the network. So microkernels are... Uh, from a computer science perspective, a much more elegant way to build systems. But where they fall over is usually a uh, uh, from a performance perspective. So Linux, uh, by being a monolithic kernel or um, or, or, or even FreeBSD or OpenBSD, um, have the advantage that by running everything in uh, in a single address space in the kernel, they can uh, gain efficiency to scale. So they can context switch between a network stack and a storage stack, uh, and also their memory subsystem all within the same process space. Uh, and because we do this a lot, typically when when building network systems, uh, they're just faster and more efficient than a typical microkernel. But then in the late 90s, uh, a bunch of people from MIT and also in, in Cambridge in my group started looking for hybrids between microkernels and monolithic kernels. And these are called exokernels. And how these work is that they let the entire application link to kernel subsystems and specialize themselves based on what their application needs are. So, for example, if I'm running a web server, I might not want to share my TCP IP stack or my network card with any other drivers. I only want my operating system to serve web traffic. So in this case, there's no point protecting the, the physical device driver from the application. And what an exokernel lets you do is to directly link these systems together and form a specialized kernel that will only serve web traffic. And it's very hard to multiplex this with other users or any other applications because it is designed for one thing and one thing only. And so exokernels never really took off uh, because, but they, they were in the late 90s, the performance kings of operating systems. Uh, and so it's in this background that we came to looking at Mirage, which is that you have microkernels, which are the the elegant kings of uh, operating system design, but rarely used uh, in in real uh, desktop and server systems. They're they're quite common in mobile and embedded, but but less so in uh, in the in the in the in the bigger operating systems. Uh, and then you have exokernels, which are these uh, these nice hybrids. And then you have monolithic kernels, which form the uh, the basis for most of the operating systems that the listeners will be familiar with. So could you give us a picture of a if I'm in a data center, I have a box. What do I put on the box? Is it a hypervisor? Do I have multiple of these or one per box? How, what's the architecture for uh, from the hardware up of a machine that's running these kernels? Got it. So now if you if you look at the, the data center from the early 2000s, uh, say before VMware came in the scene, you would have to install a physical operating system, typically Windows or Linux, on a um, uh, on on a on a server machine, and you would have to configure that exactly to the specification that you want. So typically, you would uh, install a database, install a web server, install uh, a directory service of some kind, and you would have to make sure that each of these services aren't cross-talking to each other, uh, and that the the backup solutions and so on are all in place for these machines. So the revolution that came about with uh, with VMware and Zen, which are two two hypervisors, is that they had the ability to carve up a physical machine into multiple virtual machines. Uh, so taking Zen as an example, because that's what I'm most familiar with, you first of all install Zen on a physical machine. And when Zen boots up, it's an extremely simple hypervisor. It's called a type one hypervisor that only does three things. Uh, it, it looks at all the memory present in the machine, and it looks at the number of CPUs and cores, and it uh, it categorizes those, and it uh, figures out the interrupt system. So this is the system that uh, uh, external devices use to communicate with the rest of the machine. It Zen knows nothing about how to run these physical devices. So what it does is that it spins up a special uh, guest operating system. So typically this is called Domain Zero, and this Domain Zero is Linux usually, or it can be Solaris or uh, NetBSD, uh, and hopefully soon FreeBSD. And this domain zero takes care of running the physical device drivers. Now, this wouldn't be very interesting if you can only run a domain zero. So Zen also lets you spin up multiple domain U's, which are guest operating systems. And these have the illusion that they're running inside a physical machine. But in fact, what's happening behind the scenes is that Zen is faking out their physical device drivers and proxying any requests that you have for the network or the block devices to the real physical devices present in DOM zero. So the stack, as the operating system sees it, is that the Zen hypervisor boots up in the very beginning, and it boots up a domain zero, which is the uh, the physical uh, domain that runs all the physical device drivers. And then you can have many, many domains which form the guests. So 
in a typical Zen installation, you have a few hundred virtual machines that all uh, think they're running in a physical instance, but in fact communicate through the domain zero to uh, to to actually run their uh, their their own networking needs. And so the revolution came about in, in manageability because I could take a bunch of physical machines that were formerly running Windows or or, or Linux, uh, but perhaps weren't utilized at 100%. So typically, if you're running um, a database uh, on a likely load website, it might be running 10% of the time. And we could consolidate all of these virtual machines into a single Zen box. Uh, that was then fully utilized, and these could be managed through nice software interfaces. Uh, so the stack itself is, uh, is is about three or four levels deep now. You have the, you have the Zen hypervisor, uh, you have uh, domain zero running, which is the uh, the physical do- domain. You have the guest virtual machines running, which run their own kernels, and then finally you have, of course, the user spaces in those kernels, which actually executes the application um, at hand. And now, are you talking about the generic virtualization architecture, or is is it the same when you're running? Mirage kernels as the guest VMs. Ah, so so this is where Mirage comes in. So one of the frustrations with this software stack is that it was amazing for consolidating physical machines. Uh, if if I have a hundred Windows machines and I do not want to touch them because I'm not entirely sure what's running on them, then I can just consolidate them using Zen without having to change any of my operating procedures. In the long term, though, this leads us to this slightly odd model where we keep building up these layers of abstraction uh, in our software stacks. So every 10 years, uh, we tend to add a new layer because we're not quite sure what to do with the old ones. So if you look at uh, a modern application server, you have the hypervisor, you have the, uh, the operating system kernel, you have user space. Then increasingly, in the last 10 years, we use high-level languages. So we have a uh, language runtime that has its own garbage collector, like a, a JVM or the .NET runtime. Then on top of that, you have threads. And then on top of that, you have uh, application-specific logic. So you can see how the stack is just getting increasingly complex. So what we want to do with Mirage, and this is the reason why it's called Mirage, is that we wanted to push a lot of this complexity into the compiler. So instead of depending on our runtime to figure out exactly what all these layers do, we wanted to uh, just say, well, why can't I compile a specialized appliance for one purpose only? And this should be this is reminiscent of Exokernel. Uh, and then this, this specialized appliance will have all of the functionality that it doesn't need discarded at compile time. So the final thing that I deploy to the cloud is a very, very small specialized image. And we can do this for two reasons. The first one is that we no longer have to uh, have these general purpose Swiss army knife operating systems. Because when I run something in the cloud, um, I can just say, I want to run a web server and a database. And I can spin up a virtual machine for each one. I can pay for them individually. And if I need more database nodes, I can just spin up more nodes. If I need more web server nodes, I spin up more nodes. Uh, and at no point do I need to uh, shoehorn in some database functionality into a web server. Or a storage server does not have to become a web server. I can just make a software API call to Amazon or Rackspace and get a new virtual machine for that purpose. So this has really changed the way that we have to uh, think about deploying and managing systems in a, in, a, in, a, in a DevOps context. And Mirage is really designed to fit into that new world and really not try to worry too much about backwards compatibility. And the other thing that um, has changed from the late 90s to now is that we don't really care so much about binary compatibility. So it might have been in the old days that I had to run Word or I had to run IIS server or I had to run MySQL. These days, most of the interconnects in the cloud are done through pretty well standardized protocols. So really what I want my virtual machine to do is to uh, talk HTTP to another service or uh, to talk the MySQL or the, the PostgreSQL binary protocol or to talk some XML RPC or JSON protocol instead. So this means that within the virtual machine, uh, there is no need for compatibility with Linux or, or Windows. It's only the external protocols that we we communicate with that we have to remain compatible with. So Mirage was formed in a context where uh, we can use the cloud to give us a nice virtual framework where we can just build a, build a new operating system, but it only has to support virtual device drivers, so we don't have to support every uh, physical device in the world, and we don't have to worry so much about backwards compatibility, and we can rethink the rest of the operating system stack. And the goal with Mirage is to make it as invisible as possible. So I should be able to write some nice high-level code and synthesize these nice little specialized kernels, but myself not have to be a kernel programmer. I just want to write high-level code in OCaml in this case and uh, have the results magically optimized way by my compiler. So in many ways, it's analogous to uh, what it must have felt like to write programs in the early days of computing when you would just put in some punch cards into, into, into a machine and it would magically uh, you know, assemble those and execute those uh, in a much more efficient form than you had before.
through the years since, our compilers tend to just stop at arbitrary points. So when I run GCC, it just stops at the object file. When I run um, an executable, it runs within a kernel and then it doesn't do any further optimizations. With Mirage, we just wanted to look at the entire system we're deploying and try to do higher level reasoning and compilation on, on, on top of all of the layers that we have access to. So try to recapture uh, some of the simplicity that we had in, uh, in, in, uh, in older computer systems. So Anil, you've given us some examples, database and web server. Give a few other examples briefly of the type of services that a Mirage kernel would offer. So imagine um, you can compile anything that you you want to run in the cloud right now. You can compile a Mirage equivalent for that. So the most popular one that we're doing so far is uh, is compiling up our home pages. So of course, having built Mirage, uh, we wanted to just use it for our own personal infrastructure. Uh, and so we built a little blogging and wiki infrastructure, and we turned the Mirage website, which is on openmirage.org, uh, into a self-hosted uh, entity. And we did this in the very early days of the project. The project has been going for about four years. And in the first year, we uh, we got the entire thing self-hosting um, all the way from uh, the, the website and the DNS infrastructure. And what this brought out was, uh, although this was uh, in the early days, a very, very kind of quickly hacked a prototype that we published in, um, I think, in Usenix Hot Cloud, it made it clear exactly what the type of things we needed to host an end-to-end -end service on the internet were. So for example, um, let's say I want to host openmirage.org online. The first thing I need is I need somewhere to run the DNS. Uh, this is the domain name service that resolves openmirage.org into a concrete IP address. Uh, and so the first thing we did was to build a DNS server that was the equivalent of uh, Bind or NSD for those familiar with DNS uh, in Mirage. And we evaluated it against the existing versions. We made it nice and fast. Um, and VeriSign gave us some funding to improve the uh, DNS infrastructure there in, uh, in 2010. Uh, and we put this live, and it was remarkable how small it was. So this DNS server uh, was 100 kilobytes in size. So compare that to an entire, for example, Ubuntu distribution running in the cloud, which is regularly uh, going up to a gigabytes in size. We had a microkernel that would serve um, just DNS uh, in 100 kilobytes of, uh, of, of memory. And so we call these specialized microkernels unikernels. They were single purpose, do one thing, and if you wanted to reconfigure them, they would, they would just have to be recompiled and the old one destroyed and the new one deployed. So uh, when we had DNS, we then moved on to HTTP because um, I've uh, served the traffic and I now want to respond to web requests. But before you can serve HTTP, it turns out, well, you need to have a TCP stack. And normally Linux gives you a TCP stack in order to communicate over that protocol, but we didn't have that. But when it comes to building a TCP stack, you also need to have uh, DHCP because you need to obtain an IP address from Amazon. You need to have an Ethernet stack to deal with the lower level uh, virtual Ethernet abstraction, and you need to have device drivers um, to actually drive the Zen device driver. So we spent about a year building all of these in pure camel from scratch, uh, and it became obvious exactly what set of protocols you needed uh, to run a a uh, dedicated homepage. So once we had Ethernet, we had DHCP, we had uh, IP, we had TCP, uh, we have uh, then wrote an HTTP stack. And finally, we got to serve uh, our uh, DNS responses and our HTTP responses uh, from the homepage. And this is very motivational because uh, it means that we were now convinced that there was nothing we couldn't do in the internet protocol space uh, to serve up simple web-based uh, infrastructure. And once you have a web server, there's a lot of things you can do. So obviously, you can serve up JavaScript and you can build RESTful APIs. Um, so our homepages have little examples of um, uh, tiny REST-based uh, uh, protocols that you can use to update uh, comments and, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, this is a nice way to, to drive one particular uh, set of functionality. But then once you have all these networking protocols, it became obvious that we also needed some story for storage. And so this is something we've been developing in the last year is a database uh, based on the principles of Git. So instead of uh, having a conventional file system like FAT or NTFS or um, EXT, uh, we decided that we would actually version control everything. So we wanted to live in a world where every single unikernel that was serving our home pages would actually just form a node in, in a Git version control tree. And so we've been building the infrastructure such that whenever a unikernel starts, it forks its storage from a Git database. All of its changes are written into a branch and then reconciled and pushed back to a central Git repository, which can itself be hosted in GitHub. And because these, uh, these repositories are so small, uh, it, it turns out that we can actually track the source code for our unikernels within Git itself. 
So instead of having a separate uh, image tracking system that would track all of the Ubuntu gold images or the FreeBSD gold images that we need, well, we just compile a unikernel, we commit the result, which is typically a megabyte in size, into a Git repository, and we track the whole thing as one entire universe of, of version control. So once we built DNS servers and uh, we had our home pages running there, we've now got version control running in storage as well. And so this is a good example of how uh, sometimes you have to obey existing protocols. For example, we have to obey um, uh, DHCP and TCP IP, but other times you don't have to uh, listen to conventional wisdom. So in this case, we looked at existing systems. Uh, Dave Scott from Citrix built a uh, FAT32 equivalent, so we could, li we could read USB sticks and so on. But we just didn't want to go down the path of aping existing file systems because they're very, very complicated. They're, they're very ill-specified. And it's not at all clear that uh, replicating their functionality would, would win us anything in a unikernel world. So we're discovering that uh, sometimes uh, just changing these interfaces and trying something new is actually a very big win. Uh, so a Git version control system is the big thing we're working on now. In terms of other uses um, in the cloud, th there's actually the software that runs the cloud itself. Uh, and this is actually the thing that funded and uh, was the reason for building Mirage in the first place. So consider Zen, which is running uh, a, a large data center. And this data center is perhaps serving 100,000 hosts. And these 100,000 physical hosts could themselves run a couple of hundred VMs each. So before you know it, you have a data center running this uh, one bit of software that is running m tens of millions of virtual machines. And clearly, you need to have a management stack that will deal with the concerns of how to start and stop these VMs in a very, very secure way. And just running the virtual machines itself is not enough. You also need to configure the storage in the network. Uh, you also need to con configure the network topology. And there's a big life cycle of things around the data center that you need to control through software. So when Zen started, all of this ran inside a single monolithic domain called Domain Zero. And Domain Zero is a full Linux instance. And it can not only run the physical device drivers, but it also runs this management stack. So what we wanted was uh, as Zen grew in importance, you know, because if anyone can compromise this domain, you've compromised your entire system. We wanted to fall back to more of a microkernel world where uh, this domain zero could be broken up into lots and lots of small pieces. So a lot of the upstream Zen developers added support. Andy Warfield's team in UBC, for example, added support for uh, breaking up this big domain zero into lots of small so-called driver domains. And each of these driver domains would be responsible for just one tiny part of running the physical system. So, for example, my storage stack to my QLogic uh, HBA could be running a storage domain that would be driving it. And my network card to my, uh, my 10 gigabit network devices would be running in a different domain entirely. So if my storage device driver were to crash for some reason, then it would reboot and the networking would be unaffected. So this gives us the ability to really control this, this, uh, a lot of the infrastructure in a single host in a very fine-grained way and therefore increase reliability. And so what Mirage uh, was really useful for was to build a control stack for this kind of distributed system because, of course, there's no point building a, um, a microkernel-based system if the thing controlling it is itself a monolithic kernel that can just fail at any point. So the first use of Mirage was actually to just control the Zen boxes itself. And we've had a huge number of code contributions from Citrix, so uh, who maintains Zen. So Dave Scott is the uh, the principal architect behind that, John Ludlam, uh, Rob Hoos, uh, Thomas Elsa. A lot of people have been contributing code uh, for the express purpose of making Mirage a good platform to, to actually manage Zen with itself. Uh, and this is an ongoing process. So um, uh, the, the, a lot of the pieces of Mirage have already been integrated into the, the Zen management stack, but uh, and we continue to do so as well. So we've we've gone from uh, lots of self-hosting, which drives one particular cloud use case, and also building very low-level system components for Zen that we need very fine-grained control over, and we can use the same sets of source code to serve both of those as well. So this obviously lets us, as a small team, kind of build up some very complicated components from very well-structured modular uh, pieces written in uh, written in a camel. You raised a number of interesting points in that description. I wanted to follow up on the resource consumption issue. How much work can you get out of the same box running microkernels versus running monolithic Linux kernels running multiple services? How does it do on a resource consumption standpoint in delivering throughput at lower cost? That's a that's a it's a good question. It, the the answer really depends on the nature of your workloads. So if you are running in a mobile phone system, for example, where um, you need some very strong isolation between certain components, for example, your uh, 3G 
firmware might need to be completely firewalled away from your app store in Android. So at this point, um, you, you care less about resource consumption and more about strong isolation. When you move to more cloud-like workloads, what these typically look like is you're just serving up a lot of network connections and you want to do this with the minimum resource usage. So in this world, a traditional microkernel would actually be very slow because in order to serve a single network connection, it would need to context switch across many, many different domains. Now, a virtualized monolithic kernel, for example, Linux running on top of Zen, uh, running running on Amazon, uh, would also actually be quite slow because every time it transmits a, uh, a packet from an application, the application would synthesize the response. It would then go from its user space into the virtual kernel, which would then go from the virtual kernel into the domain zero kernel in Zen, which would then go to the, uh, go to the outside world. In a Mirage world, we, we collapse a lot of the stacks in the, in, in, the, in the virtual address space. So this means that for a Mirage appliance to reply back to uh, a web response, it only has to go from domain zero uh, to the virtual uh, unikernel and it would just be responded to immediately. So there's no kind of bouncing within of layers within the virtual uh, appliance itself. So we've, we've actually done some, uh, some benchmarking of this, and um, there's two major wins. The first one is uh, just in straightforward throughput. You can build systems that, that work at 10 gigabit speeds, for example, um, and they require significantly less CPU than you do in, um, in, in other systems. And the other slightly non-obvious win is actually in latency. Because you have to go through fewer layers of abstraction, you can actually respond with very, very low latency uh, to, to external application requests. Uh, and the other thing is boot time. So because these unikernels are so simple, you can boot them in uh, milliseconds. So in other words, if I, I want to absolutely reduce the amount of money I'm spending on the cloud, I could uh, respond to an incoming network connection by spinning up a unikernel that would boot up in, say, 10 milliseconds. And then as soon as it's done, it would just uh, shut itself down again. So instead of having to take a heavyweight approach by spinning up a big Linux uh, virtual machine, I could just spin up tiny, tiny little unikernels on demand and have an extremely elastic approach to to scaling my resources. So a good follow-up for this is uh, a paper we published in uh, the architectural support for uh, program languages and operating systems in 2013. So if you go to the Mirage homepage, uh, we have a, a paper called Unikernels, Library Operating Systems of the Cloud. And we have a number of benchmarks in there which demonstrate uh, DNS and TCP and uh, web workloads and OpenFlow using Mirage versus uh, equivalents in uh, a normal software stack such as Linux. We'll link to that paper in the show notes. Now, if I've understood this correctly, you might have uh, Mirage running a web server, Mirage running database. They need to communicate. So you've pushed the communication overhead into the Zen layer. Is that correct? Well, so this is where things start getting a bit complicated. If you're running a database and a web server in a normal Linux stack, and then if they're running on the same machine, you might configure, for example, MySQL to use a Unix domain socket on the same host to connect to the web server. Um, now, if these are running in a virtual machine on the cloud, you typically ha are forced to use TCP IP. And so this means that no matter where these virtual machines are running, they will always have to communicate by marshalling a TCP IP connection and uh, connecting to the other side and hope for the best. Now, this is, this is uh, very efficient, but it's also uh, not as efficient as it could be because you, the best way to get faster is by doing less work. So Zen supports a number of highly efficient shared memory abstractions that if you're on the same host between the same virtual machine, you can directly connect uh, via a shared memory ring and have uh, extremely fast. So we're talking about uh, 60 to 100 gigabits of throughput just by going over these shared memory rings. Uh, the problem is how do you manage these rings? Because if 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 I know that my web server is on the same physical host as my database, then I can I can negotiate these connections. But if I live relocate this virtual machine to a different host, then the, the connection will break because obviously there's no shared memory connection anymore. And on the cloud, one of the really nice features is that you can just move virtual machines around physical hosts without them knowing about it. So this is one good example of where Linux or FreeBSD's approach to networking just breaks down. Because um, if I had a, uh, a single connection, it's actually very, very difficult to, um, without the application knowing, redirect the connection to a shared memory channel or, and then switch to TCP whenever a live migration happens. So in Mirage, we're developing a new networking stack called Fable. And the idea is that this is, uh, this is a network stack that will understand, based on probing its environment, if it can make a shared memory connection. And if it can't, it will fall back to 
uh, a normal TCP IP connection. And uh, if, if that breaks, it will try to find other strategies to connect. So the idea is that in the cloud environment, we just really don't know anything about our environment. And so a, a networking stack has to figure out more details about uh, how it runs on. So I gave a talk at uh, FOSDEM about this, which is the, uh, the one of the biggest European open source meetings. And I had a quiz asking people about um, their any myths about IO. And it turns out that almost no one in the audience had a complete understanding how, of how all of the different things that form a modern networking stack fit together. Because we have so many layers now that this stuff is just insanely complicated. And then when you add on security, for example, um, SSL or um, things of that nature, it gets even more complicated because you have to not only manage network connections, but also security uh, keys and so on. So one of the most interesting projects going on right now in Mirage is a clean slate SSL stack that uh, tries to abstract away a lot of the complexity, but keep secure key material in one place, uh, keep track of shared memory channels in one place, and keep track of uh, external network connections in another place, and provide a simpler API to applications to, uh, uh, to access all of these things. Is your FOSDEM paper available anywhere? It is. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, there's, it's on my web page. It's called the Wild West of Unix IO. Okay, we'll put that in the show notes as well. So you raised the issue of security. Could you say more about the security comparison of a unikernel to a monolithic kernel? So uh, whenever the first uh, exokernels were built uh, in the late 90s, they were all built using C. And one of the uh, the big benefits was performance, but people didn't really care so much about security because um, obviously you know they just wanted to prove that they could just build extremely high throughput or very reliable systems. When we came to building this in the cloud, our primary goal, uh, way ahead of performance, was to build an end-to-end secure system. That is, that no component in a Mirage kernel uh, should be uh, memory unsafe. That is, it should guarantee that you will not lead to lots of low-level bugs um, where at all possible. So in a modern Mirage system, only the runtime, the language runtime of, for a camel and a tiny, tiny boot layer is actually written in C. Everything from the device drivers up, so from the shared memory abstractions to the uh, the network protocols to talk to Zen, uh, to the actual uh, coordination protocols to talk to the host, uh, to the TCP IP stack, is all written on a camel. And this means that um, any single packet coming in is bounce checked for, um, uh, for checking that it doesn't violate uh, uh, basic security properties all the way through to the kernel. And you might think that this is slightly paranoid, but if you follow the news, then OpenSSL had yet another serious exploit yesterday called Heartbleed. And the way that Heartbleed works is that a simple heartbeat through SSL to a virtual machine, uh, sorry, to a service was not bounce checked. And this lets anyone on the internet read up to 64 kilobytes of your memory. So this would just be impossible in Mirage because the OCaml code that uh, underlies the the actual uh, um, uh, network stack checks that every single access is permitted with respect to the, uh, the, the the protocol specification that the program has written. So even if you make a mistake and you try to step out of bounds, it will just raise an exception and it will terminate the connection. So this is the kind of property that we're trying to build all the way through our, our, our stacks. And one of the really nice things about a camel is that in addition to giving you these low-level guarantees for just checking memory safety, it also has one of the world's most powerful module systems when it comes to programming languages. And this means that we can take lots of small, well-specified, simple modules and compose them to form a much more complicated system without violating a lot of the safety guarantees that each of these modules have. So a module... Uh, a modular style of programming is very similar to um, object-oriented programming, except that it doesn't mix up the concerns of state and uh, and uh, and, da- and the actual data transformations that are happening at the same time through the code. So it is purely trying to say that um, we will specify well-defined transformations over your code and not worry so much about encapsulating the actual data that's handled elsewhere. So the two major security gains for Mirage are modular programming through high-level or camel code and low-level garbage collection and bounce checking throughout the entire system to make sure that uh, nothing escapes the uh, uh, the garbage collector so that everything is cleaned up where possible and bounce checked where possible as well. You've given us some of the reasons why OCaml is well-suited to building this type of system. Would you tell us the story of how you chose the language for this project and anything else about OCaml that you think people would be interested in. 
Sure. So as, as with all good things, it started with a cup of coffee in 2003 over, uh, um, over an argument about an OpenSSH bug. So back when I was an OpenSSH developer, there was a very serious bug in OpenSSH uh, that was about as serious as the OpenSSL bug from, from last week. And it resulted, it was, a, it was an integer overflow that resulted in hundreds of millions of hosts just getting hacked through, through worms. And so I was sitting with Dave Scott, who's now at Citrix, and we were wondering why we couldn't just build uh, an equivalent in a, in a safe language. And the reasons for this were, were many. You know, the idea that you could um, build a fast server in a garbage collector language was still not quite believed by people back then. Uh, and also just the sheer amount of effort it would take to re-implement these protocols because there's so much of them. Uh, and so, of course, after I had the coffee, we just decided to give it a shot. Uh, and my PhD turned into solving a lot of the problems that went into building one of these services. So I built uh, lots of domain-specific languages for packet parsing safely within our camel, yet still maintaining performance, and lots of hooks to formally verify aspects of the system using model checkers uh, that would uh, check the state space. So by about 2006, uh, I'd finished my PhD, and we had an, an, an SSH server and a DNS server all built using a camel, but they were research prototypes, and you know, published those papers, and we thought that they, that was the end of the story. In 2006, uh, both of us joined ZenSource, which was commercializing Zen, uh, and we used OCaml to build the control stack for uh, one of the earlier versions of the commercial version of Zen, which is now used by uh, some huge companies. For example, Rackspace uh, deploys their entire Rackspace cloud by using some of the code we wrote. Um, and all of this code was written in, uh, in OCaml. So this is a database, uh, uh, all of the management stack. And we published some retrospectives on how OCaml was a really good, good use for this. It turns out that back in those days, there was actually no other choice for building these kind of embedded systems in a safe language. So Go didn't exist then. Uh, Rust didn't exist then. O OCaml was a 10-year-old operating system in, in, um, in 2005. And it had a reputation for being an absolutely rock-solid runtime. Uh, there's very few bugs in there and a very simple runtime. So it's one that if we did find a bug, we could debug it ourselves without having to uh, to wade through millions of lines of code. Uh, and the faith in OCaml has just been been borne out through the last the last uh, ten or fifteen years because in the whole time we used it commercially, we found I think one bug uh, in the compiler that had already been fixed in the next version. So uh, it's just an extremely solid and well engineered system that you can depend on to build uh, mission critical code. And then the only problem became, could we hire people fast enough to uh, to suit the needs of a growing startup? And it turns out that was just no problem. Uh, functional programming is just becoming more and more popular. And people joined us specifically so they could learn OCaml and actually improve their skills at the same time as working on something uh, as exciting as Zen uh, and, and the cloud. So generally, it was a win-win situation. And so the Mirage project grew out of all of this uh, this this work. You mentioned earlier how you compile a kernel using the OCaml compiler, which inserts a lot of other layers of software to build the complete kernel. Walk us through the tool chain. If I want to build a Mirage that does DNS or a web server, what are all the tools? How do they work together? What's the result? Got it. So this is actually very, very simple now. Um, uh, my colleague Amir Chowdhury published a blog post on how you can go from a Jekyll website, which is a, a blog generator, uh, to a unikernel in 50 lines of code. So that's actually linked from the uh, Open Mirage website. And the reason this is so simple is because um, all of the code you need to build a Mirage system is handled by a package manager that uh, Thomas Gazanier wrote called OPAM. And so when you install OPAM, it uh, it downloads a uh, package database. You'll be familiar with these package systems from other languages. Um, and it has all of the uh, infrastructure required to build uh, to build any Mirage library. And then we have a command line tool called Mirage. And you, you give it two things. You give it the unikernel source code, for example, for a website. And you give it a little specification of how to compile that source code. Uh, and now there are multiple ways you can compile a Mirage application. I could compile a web server to run on my, on my Mac OS machine, so I can debug it locally. Or I can compile it to run um, in Mac OS or Linux, but using the full networking stack from Mirage. So instead of depending on the Linux kernel, it would just use our OCaml networking stack instead. And then finally, I can get rid of Mac OS entirely and recompile the same source code into a Zen microkernel, all from the same, uh, the same tree in the same build system. And so the Mirage command line tool gives you all of the options to pull this off. So the workflow is that uh, you build your system using uh, Mac OS or whatever operating system you want locally. Uh, when you've debugged it and you're happy with it, you then simply recompile everything, and the output is a Zen microkernel. 
Now, to glue all of this together, uh, we've actually been using other people's services. Uh, and so we, we use something called Travis, which is a continuous integration system that runs um, against GitHub. And so all we have to do to build one of these kernels in practice is that we push a source code diff uh, to the Mirage website uh, on GitHub. Travis picks it up. It builds a complete uh, copy of the website, and it pushes the resulting Zen microkernel into another GitHub repository. So if you go to the Mirage organization on GitHub, you can go to mirage-www, that has a source code. Then you can go to mirage-www-deployment, and that has the resulting builds from uh, from the Travis website. So everything we do is just tracked in GitHub. So to build one of these websites, you just have to uh, set up three repositories, set up Travis, which is free, free for use, um, and then uh, use a cloud service like Amazon or Rackspace to actually run the resulting kernel. And everything can be done using existing cloud services now. The beautiful thing is that whenever you commit these things into GitHub, you know everything that went into your deployed service. So there is nothing that we have that we cannot track through Git that we deploy in the cloud. So if I come back to this in 10 years, I will have a version controlled copy of everything I did to compile it. And this is a serious problem if you're using existing cloud services where you just lose track of what's going on very, very quickly. Uh, and the final piece of the puzzle is uh, we've just um, um, had support from a company called Cod Codio, if you go to codio.com, that provide a web-based IDE. And they actually give us a container where you can install OPAM purely from a web-based interface and do all of the edits to the source code uh, without having to have it installed locally. So we have a pure web-based workflow where you can log into Codio, build Mirage Union kernels, uh, and deploy the results using Amazon EC2 uh, and uh, use Travis to continue uh, the uh, deployment builds. So it's all it's all nicely integrated and, uh, and working these days. It's still more complicated than using Heroku, but it's a great learning experience for anyone who wants to uh, you know work through all of the layers that goes into building one of these uh, platforms as a service engines. Once you've got that process in place, how long is it from when you hit save in your browser-based IDE before your Mirage kernel is booted up and running? So um, if you do a Travis... Uh, if you do a push to GitHub and then get Travis to build it, it typically takes about uh, six to seven minutes for it to build the entire operating system. And remember, this is doing it from scratch. So it's uh, it's building up everything from uh, OPAM and OCaml all the way through to your your final Zen website by building a, a source code uh, based uh, push. If you decide to build uh, binary snapshots, you could be doing the final link in a matter of seconds. So uh, we have some prototypes where um, if you do a minor change to a configuration file, you can have the result deployed within five seconds to, to a cloud service. And our latest work is to try to bring this down to milliseconds. So the idea is that if you want to do uh, something that fixes a critical security hole, uh, we should be able to push the security fix to GitHub and have all of our unikernels updated within seconds. So none of this business of us having to manually recompile uh, and, and track all of our layers of software, because we're tracking everything in Git, we should just use Git to itself trigger rebuilds of all of our critical infrastructure. If I have web applications written in one of the more popular languages, can you build a Mirage microkernel with, let's say, a Ruby runtime or a JVM, and then load your existing application into that? <laughs> so this is this is as you might imagine one of the most popular questions that I get. So it it it, it does take one thing to build these unikernel systems. It takes a bloody-minded determination to not relax um, some of the some of the stands that we take when building the system in the first place. So one of the decisions we made was we wanted to have an understandable uh, and simple to use runtime and compiler infrastructure, and this is why we stuck with the camel all the way through. Uh, partly because OCaml is a great language to work in, but also because working in two languages, it just gets so much more complicated. You have to deal with uh, linkage across the systems, differences in semantics and protecting one from the other. And before you know it, you just got a full operating system. So um, the, the way to do multiple languages is by building a unikernel for Ruby or unikernel for Python or unikernel for PHP. Uh, and there's actually been quite a lot of progress in this space. So if you look at... Um, the modern set of languages, uh, one of the most mature ones is HalVM by Galois Systems. And uh, this is a Haskell equivalent of uh, of Mirage, uh, but 
but built using um, the Haskell style of programming, which is purely functional uh, and lazy. There's also a service. Unfortunately, the source code is not available yet, but uh, they might have, might have plans to release it, is Erlang and Zen, which is also another functional language based on message passing. Uh, and another one for Java is called OSV, which has just been done by the uh, the funders of the, the KVM hypervisor. Uh, and they, they have a focus uh, on building much more compatible systems uh, using the using the Java uh, and Go runtimes as well. Now, one thing that Mirage has that these systems don't have is this emphasis on modular programming. So uh, we're we're um, we're focused less on backwards compatibility and more on how to build this new generation of really modular and easy to use components that we can use for uh, for in multiple contexts. Um, but we don't really have a focus in trying to wrap existing uh, systems such as uh, Ruby and Rails a website in, into Mirage. The the answer here is rewrite and restructure it, um, and the process of rewriting it will actually improves the system significantly because you typically come up with new insights about how you want to um, structure the system. If you do want to maintain the compatibility, just run a virtual machine running Linux and you can you can you can control that entire virtual machine using Mirage um, and uh, and you know switch it on and off and configure the network stack but, uh, but you can just use virtualization to run uh, code in the old style and uh, save all of the new stuff for Mirage. Another talk you gave that I watched you really emphasize how the type system of OCaml contributed to your design goals in Mirage. Tell us about that. Right. So when 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 building a, a new operating system, it's impossible to re-emphasize how easy it is to get tangled up in all kinds of components that are just interlocked and seemingly lacking any form of structure. Uh, one of the reasons why OCaml is such a wonderful language to work with for this kind of large scale system is that it, it has really two different modes of running. Um, whenever you write a single OCaml module, it has something called automatic type inference. And this means that when I, whenever I write a function, I do not need to declare that um, any given variable is an integer or a string or uh, some other kind of data structure. The use of that will inform the the compiler about how it sh what its type should be. And if at any point when writing my code um, or using someone else's code, um, two variables disagree on the definition of one of the variables, this is a type error. For example, if I try to add one to a string, then one of those is clearly a bug, and therefore the compiler will complain and point out the, the dissonance. So local type reference is extremely useful for writing succinct small bits of code, and we use this extensively just everywhere through Mirage. Uh, when it comes to rewriting your device drivers and low-level systems, uh, we find that the OCaml code is just smaller and easier to read than the equivalent written in C, which is the uh, obviously the gold standard for writing this kind of systems code. Um, the second half, though, is where OCaml really comes into its own, which is a module system. So the module system has no type inference. It's a very explicit way of wrapping some functionality and uh, enforcing abstraction barriers. So let's say, for example, I've got a file descriptor. And the file descriptor in Unix is an integer. In OCaml, I can actually say that um, I want users of my file descriptor library uh, to only treat uh, an FD as an abstract type. That is, they will have no idea that it's actually an, an integer under the hood. Um, but whenever this is compiled, um, the compiler checks that no one is assuming that an FD is an integer. And then it eliminates all of the, uh, the type assertions at compile time. So the, this abstraction that we put together using the module system has no runtime cost. It is simply something that the compiler checks, and then it discards it, it erases it, and the runtime looks very much like C. It's just an integer under the hood that is uh, that is being used in, in a very normal context. So this emphasis on abstraction without cost um, is a really, really incredible feature of, of uh, building big static type systems. The best way to summarize this is something that uh, Ron Minsky from Jane Street came up with, which is that the OCaml type system makes illegal states unrepresentable. So that is, if there is something that I know as a programmer should never happen, we can probably use the OCaml type system to enforce that abstraction. And we don't have to worry about that. The compiler worries about it for us uh, for, the, for the rest of the uh, duration of the lifetime of that library. And given that we have over 100, 100 libraries now, repositories, uh, we have about 2,000 third-party libraries written in our camel, it's obvious that we need to depend on something other than human beings to enforce a lot of these safety properties. And that's where the camel type system is, uh, is just a wonderful thing to use. Do you see a scenario where running a Mirage inside a web browser creates opportunity to do things easily that are difficult or impossible to do right now? Yes, absolutely. So this is our biggest focus right now. Um, uh, one of the 
one of the reasons I came back to academia after ZenSource in, in 2009 was because I was very, very concerned about the state of uh, personal data management. And uh, even in 2009, it was obvious that a lot of the infrastructure that we are building for society is going into centralized cloud systems. So things like Dropbox and Facebook and Google, while incredibly useful, are uh, centralized and somewhat of an antithesis to the way that we uh, envision the internet developing in the uh, in the early optimistic days, shall we say. So the new system in Mirage we're building is a replacement for your personal homepage and your personal infrastructure, where your entire uh, stack of everything from DNS to HTTP to storage uh, to communication is handled by embedded devices uh, running on ARM nodes that are built using Mirage. And the idea behind this system is that um, if you d built one of these systems using, using conventional technology, you would find that you would be left having to manage an entire uh, network of machines and devices yourself, and this would quickly become a security nightmare. So what we want is uh, us to write high-level code in a camel and to compile it and track it using this Git workflow that I described earlier um, and result and run the result in embedded devices that are all at the edge of the network. For example, uh, in your house, at your workplace, within your mobile phone, and even embedded within web browsers. And one of the key uh, advantages of a camel is that we can compile the same source code um, into all of these uh, very foreign environments. Uh, so the Zen hypervisor itself has just had support for ARM. So uh, it's now possible to run Zen not only on x86, but also on a bunch of new ARM boards. For example, the QB board 2, uh, the QB truck, and um, uh, the new Chromebooks can all run Zen because the, uh, the ARM architecture now supports virtualization. Uh, and we also have a version of Mirage that uh, is being developed at the moment that compiles to a Raspberry Pi kernel as well. So if you have a Raspberry Pi, um, you can just write some OCaml source code and just boot it up from scratch on an existing little Raspberry Pi device. So we're really optimistic that um, uh, that a lot of the code we've developed for the cloud-based system will actually help us uh, build what we call the edge cloud. That is uh, a network of devices that are as easy to use as the cloud, but all self-organizing, self-managing, uh, self-encrypting so that they will uh, not leak their uh, contents to other people um, and provide people with the ability to run their own little clouds that can communicate and federate in a very natural way. So this system is called Nymote, uh, where, where it's nymote.org. It's all going to be open source, of course, uh, and we're going to be launching it at OSCon in July. So this is, uh, this is something we're furiously hacking on at the moment um, as uh, the extension to our home pages and so on that we, we described earlier. So it's very, very exciting to be taking Mirage into all of these new, uh, new embedded devices and trying to figure out how to run it in lots of foreign environments. You've written a book about OCaml, real-world OCaml, functional programming for the masses. It sounds like the ambition of your book is broader than teaching people how to build an operating system kernel. It, it, it is. So OCaml is in a weird position in about 2009, um, back when we first started discussing the book. Um, it, it had a very small community of users, but those users were using OCaml in extremely mission-critical situations. For example, we were using it in Zen for uh, some very serious management stacks that uh, if they went down, entire data centers would go down. Uh, there's a company called Jane Street, which is a, a trading firm in New York that pumps billions of uh, dollars through camel every day and uh, all of their trades were written on a camel uh, and there are similar uses in aerospace and so on but it was a community of about uh, 10 to 15 kind of very very large users and it didn't really have a tail of of uh, hobbyists and people just playing around with the language and part of this was because it was just very very badly documented um, and it, it lacked a package manager that unified the community there's a number of efforts, but for whatever reason, they never quite gelled. So I was sitting in a bar in Tokyo after one of the uh, functional programming conferences with Ron Minsky, and uh, we decided in the heat of the moment to write a quick book about, about OCaml. Uh, and our friend Brian O'Sullivan told us about O'Reilly, and he told us about his book, Real World Haskell, which um, for Haskell was just a transformative book and just propelling um, to a wider audience just how simple Haskell could be for a number of situations. Uh, but of course, writing a book is just always 10 times more effort than you realize because in the process of writing the book, um, there's a bunch of stuff that you've internalized for whatever reason in the past that you just cannot explain to somebody else. For example, um, how the standard library works or uh, why you have to do this little workaround for this particular uh, bit of infrastructure. Uh, and we spent about a couple of years fixing a lot of problems in OCaml that made it difficult for newcomers to to give it a try. So the story of Real World OCaml is um, that it ended up with me starting a research group in Cambridge called OCaml Labs that uh, took on a lot of the responsibility from 
the core maintainers of a camel for building an ecosystem around the language. So Mirage is one example where we're writing a lot of a camel code, uh, but my group at our camel labs also worries about uh, things like package management, uh, making sure that our camel's type system is stable uh, and that uh, we do a lot of testing of the system, just all of the bits and pieces you need to do to make sure that the compiler remains a stable and very, very uh, robust component for the, ne- for the next couple of decades of, uh, of use, just as it has in the past. So Real World, Real World Camel uh, also took a few decisions. It's a very opinionated book. So one of the problems that our camels had in the past is that the standard library uh, is very, very minimal because it was just designed for use by the compiler and not by the wider community. So Jane Street, uh, which is a trading firm in New York, open sourced uh, their entire standard library, which they've written a million of, li- of lines of, uh, of uh, their company code using. And this standard library is called Core. And uh, it cleans up a number of aspects of uh, a standard library and provides hundreds of data structures that are often best of breed uh, in any language. For example, the hash table implementation in uh, core is ridiculously fast, even when compared to uh, one of the more optimized Java ones, for example. Uh, and so Real World Camel decided that uh, we would use core as the exclusive way to introduce newcomers to the language and not really talk about a lot of the old code. If you wanted to learn about how to program using uh, the normal standard library, there were other resources online to, to learn that. So our decision was uh, we wanted to tell people how we use OCaml for um, our use in industry and not so much worry about some of the more academic uses of, um, of uh, functional programming that have normally been used to teach, uh, to teach people about uh, uh, languages like OCaml. We have a ban on compilers, for example. So nowhere in Real World of Camel will you find um, any tutorials on how to build a compiler. There's many, many books on using a Camel for that. We instead talk about building web services, uh, how to do JSON parsing, for example, uh, and talk about building lots of little small applications that you might find a use for in a normal workplace. Now, Camel is not one of the more popular languages among web developers. Tell us about the history of the language. Right. It's, it's not a, a popular language for web developers because of its of its roots in academia. So OCaml started off um, as an extension to a very rich history of uh, programming um, formal formal systems. So in the in the 60s, for example, uh, Robin Robin Milner was at Stanford and researching lots of fundamental approaches to uh, describing uh, various computer science concepts. And this resulted uh, after a number of decades of work by some very smart people. Uh, a system called Standard ML. And Standard ML is still used and developed these days, and it's often used as teaching materials for courses in the East Coast. Um, but Standard ML was, perhaps it made the mistake of uh, adopting a formal specification. So this meant that if you wanted to change and evolve Standard ML, uh, you had to argue with the Standards Committee to make sure that your changes could be reflected eventually in the uh, in the, in the definition of the language. So meanwhile in France, uh, Xavier Lois uh, and uh, a bunch of other professors from INRIA started developing uh, Camel Lite, which was an alternative to standard ML. And in about 1996, they released OCaml, which was uh, the the Camel compiler with a native code backend that would generate extremely fast x86 and ARM and PowerPC and Spark code, uh, and also an interesting object system on top of it that would let you actually build conventional object-oriented code on top of the normal um, ML-style programming system. So OCaml, in its current form, has been around uh, since about 1996, but it's conventionally been used to build uh, academic systems. For example, uh, one of the biggest theorem provers uh, that's used by um, hundreds of academics across the world, called Coq, um, is written in OCaml. And on top of uh, uh, these theorem provers, some very large systems such as the Compcert, which is a certified C compiler that guarantees that uh, it will compile code correctly, is built on uh, built on top of that as well. So OCaml has traditionally been used to build uh, compilers. Uh, for example, the original version of Rust was written using OCaml, uh, and it hasn't really developed a, a web ecosystem of people developing these styles of libraries. But if you go to this other world uh, of building compilers, it's it's an extremely popular and pragmatic language. So one of the things uh, we've spent the last 10 years doing is developing libraries and infrastructure for building these kind of network-based um, uh, subsystems as well. So a lot of uh, the core library from Jane Street is around um, how to build TCP services and so on. And a lot of the libraries in Mirage these days are all about lightweight libraries for web programming. Now, one of the most exciting things to happen on a camel in the last few years is something called JS of a camel. And this is a compiler for normal camel bytecode that 
outputs the result into extremely efficient JavaScript. So it turns out that unlike a lot of other languages, the um, the execution of OCaml maps onto JavaScript very, very well. You can consider OCaml to be a typed version of JavaScript. Uh, and so most recently, Facebook has uh, developed a new language called Hack. And this language, uh, which is a um, and a significant improved version of PHP uh, is actually run in a web browser. Uh, it, the language compiler is written using OCaml. It's compiled into a web browser using JavaScript. Uh, and Facebook have an IDE where any developer uh, writing hack code will actually, uh, in the browser, type check the code and give them feedback instantaneously, all without having to go to a normal uh, a normal tool chain. So this is a great example of just building an entirely new language in a camel, compiling it to JavaScript, building the IDE framework so that you have a, a nice kind of you know online editor workflow and uh, not having to deal with any kind of native compilation at all. So Camel is ex incredibly portable when it comes to building these kind of embedded services. And meanwhile, other people have built uh, iOS backends for or Android backends for mobile devices. They've run it on microcontrollers. We've, of course, run it as an operating system uh, and also as kernel modules. And generally, we haven't really found anywhere where we can't um, take a little bit of a Camel code and make it map onto efficiently onto some other uh, back end. So it is really a Swiss Army knife for uh, these very foreign environments that uh, we increasingly need to run code in. If listeners would like to learn more about Mirage, other than the resources you've already mentioned, which will all be in the show notes, is there anything else you'd like them to look at? So one thing we're doing at the moment is uh, because Mirage has been included into the uh, Google Summer of Code and the Open Source Projects for Women initiatives run by the GNOME project, is that we're uh, we're working on improving the documentation and generally trying to uh, polish up all of the resources available. So everything that we do, we try to put in the website on openmirage.org. And the openmirage.org wiki and documentation is itself a Mirage application. So one thing we really encourage people to do is that if you give Mirage a try and uh, you discover that some... Uh, problem in the uh, in the documentation or some something that needs clarification is to send us a pull request. That is to build the Mirage website yourself and to edit the the Markdown files inside the repository, and and to actually send us a pull request and, and kind of experience the end-to-end -end workflow. Uh, and once you do this, a number of people that have done this have commented to me that they've then gone off and um, tried to run their own homepages using Mirage as well. So it's a uh, it's a nice way to kind of get into the workflow and just be uh, be part of the community as well. Um, apart from the, the Mirage website, one of the harder things when using Mirage is to uh, learn how to run these kernels in the cloud. So because unfortunately, there's no real standard for a lot of these cloud APIs. So once you have a Zen kernel, you need to use either OpenStack or CloudStack or Amazon um, or one of the other bespoke uh, APIs, for example, the OnApp API. And it can be very, very confusing trying to figure these things out. And that's something our small development team doesn't really have the resources to, to you know, figure out by ourselves. So if you do end up running a Mirage kernel, just you know, write a blog post about it, send us an email, uh, create a GitHub issue. Um, they're all on um, github.com slash Mirage Mirage. And we're really happy to hear about uh, people using it for interesting things. Uh, one of the most motivational things about doing open source is just hearing what people are up to, right? So, And quite often people just uh, don't realize that we like hearing that. So uh, just feel free to drop the email list and email anytime and just uh, explain what you're up to. If listeners would like to learn more about your work, what websites would you point them to? Uh, so um, the, we we uh, we have an aggregator running on openmirage.org, and uh, we also have an increasing amount of uh, blogging activity on uh, nimote.org, which is where the uh, the personal data uses in Mirage uh, will all be hosted. Uh, we also the core team also maintains blogs as well. So whenever we do something uh, of interest, we tend to just uh, uh, write a quick blog post about it. So my homepage is anildarecall.org, uh, and you can also find on the Mirage homepage uh, Thomas Casanier, uh, Richard Mortier, and David Scott, who are the other core maintainers. Of Mirage, and they all maintain their own blogs. Uh, and uh, of course, we federate the uh, the results through Atom and uh, just aggregate that onto onto Mirage. There, uh, there, there's some really exciting work going on as well, and this is somewhere where we could really use some help. Um, is to build a clean slate SSL stack at the moment. Um, so we we had uh, two uh, extremely motivated and smart people um, uh, who've uh, who've decided to work in this, Hannes and David, and they've actually built from scratch a clean slate SSL stack that 
um, obviates a lot of the known attacks against uh, against SSL. But of course, the thing missing is a lot of people reading it and uh, criticizing the code and doing code review. So, um, so they're also planning to do a blog post series about uh, the adventures they've had in building a clean slate SSL stack. And uh, people who want to follow that should just keep an eye on the Mirage homepage, and we'll update that um, across the uh, course of the summer. So, in general, we just need people reading these blog posts and. Uh, and also just giving us critical feedback as well about uh, about the usability of this uh, this whole this whole system. We'll definitely get that in the show notes. And that thank brings you. us to the end of the interview. Anil, thank you very much for speaking to Software Engineering Radio. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to uh, to uh, seeing how this project develops based on your uh, readers' feedback. We are looking for feedback. We'd love for our listeners to go on iTunes and write a review of the show. Let us know how we're doing. And this is Robert for Software Engineering Radio. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to SC Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more information about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To support us, you can advertise SE Radio by clicking the Dig, Reddit, Delicious, or Slash dot buttons on the site, or by talking about us on Facebook, Twitter, or your own blog. If you have feedback specific to an episode, please use the commenting feature on the site so that other listeners can respond to your comments as well. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under the Creative Commons 2.5 license. Please see the website for details. Thanks again for your support.